Have you ever been playing Kingdom Hearts and thought to yourself, this is entirely too loud and my thumbs hurt, I wish this was a tree instead? Yeah, me neither, but that didn't stop Kingdom Hearts the novel from being written. And let me be clear on that and say again, this is the novel we're talking about, as in completely separate from the manga. This is almost all text and reads left to right. When you think Kingdom Hearts the novel, I want you to think Grapes of Wrath, Lord of the Flies, you know, because they're all pretty much the same thing. I have done a video about the manga in a game show format, naturally, if you want to hear more about that. I've got to say, I have a pretty limited familiarity with video game novelizations. That is, novels based on already existing video games. Some series like The Witcher start off as books and make the leap to games, but in most cases the franchise starts off as a video game and someone decides that they're way too exciting and on a PlayStation, so they cram everything into something you could consume in your school library. At the end of the day, while I personally would be a bit confused as to why one would opt to experience Kingdom Hearts through a book instead of the game, I also can't really be mad at my favorite game being accessible in several different forms, whether it's this, the manga, or the Disney Plus show that'll come out when I'm 85. I received the KH1 novelization as a 2021 Christmas gift, and while it probably would have made for a better present when I was 8, the novel only existed in Japanese until it received an English localization in 2015. So from 2005 until then, the novel existed in two volumes exclusively in Japan. Since then, novelizations of every major title have been released in both Japanese and English, each one written by Tomoko Kanemaki with art by Shiro Mano. Today I want to give my general thoughts on the novel and my experience with it, staying vague if you just want an idea of what it's like in case you're interested in checking it out for yourself. Obviously you probably aren't worried about spoilers, I have a feeling you generally know how things play out, but there are little changes or moments here and there that differ from the game, so I don't want to ruin those for you if you're thinking about picking it up. But the vast majority of this video will be a painstaking breakdown of everything different, interesting, or mildly amusing I came across throughout these 276 pages. As I sort of hinted at, and I can only speak for the KH1 novel, but this is for kids. Obviously so is the game, at least first and foremost, but it somehow becomes more apparent when you're reading KH1 as opposed to playing it. I wouldn't say it's not worth reading if you're, like, a grown-up, but just go in knowing that it's not winning any Pulitzers. I would love to have a chat with someone who somehow experienced KH1 through the book before the game, because the idea of that is definitely hard for me to wrap my head around as someone who's played through the game more times than I can count. Going into this, I know what to expect, what plot beats need to be hit, and generally what the characters are gonna say, but I sort of wonder if any of it follows for someone who's completely new to it, if it's just totally incomprehensible or if they're able to visualize what's going on. The environments and characters aren't given a ton of description, but then again, you probably know what most of it looks like if you're familiar with any of the Disney properties that show up. The novel does provide brief character bios and portraits at the beginning of the book, which includes main characters like SRK, Donald and Goofy, Jiminy, Maleficent, but also more minor and world-specific characters like Beast and Genie. There are actually duplicates of some of them right at the start with minor changes, likely because the novel originally published in two volumes, both of which included bios at the start of them. So both were included in the all-in-one English version as to not lose any content, which is nice but a bit confusing before you realize what's going on. Going back to the idea of reading the book before playing the game, I have to think that some segments definitely only really work if you've played the game before. As certain cutscenes from the game are basically just being described and sometimes quite minimalistically, I'd think it'd be hard to envision what's happening just from reading the text. An example of this, and the first one I came across, was Donald and Goofy blasting off from Disney Castle. The written description doesn't quite capture the comedy of the moment and was probably better off just being rehauled entirely. At least they didn't try to make sense of the moment where Donald breaks the fourth wall and pulls down the camera in that hotel scene with Aerith, but they sadly also don't attempt to adapt the moment where he gets pancaked by the door, which was always one of the funniest moments to me as a kid. The book is comprised of 11 chapters, plus two short chapters, as the Table of Contents calls them, as well as a prologue covering the dive to the heart and an epilogue covering the post credit scene. Any mathletes out there might realize that there are 13 full worlds in KH1, but only 11 chapters, so what gives? Well, Hollow Bastion is split into two chapters, one pre- and post Kyrie Rescue, and the mid-game Return to Traverse Town gets its own chapter as well, and Olympus Coliseum, Atlantica, Halloween Town, and 100 Acre Wood are entirely cut. Well, first and foremost, I was shocked that Deep Jungle was included in this thing, considering it was cut from the manga and most obviously Chain of Memories and anything else that rehashes KH1. If you somehow avoided the nearly two-decade discourse about this, Disney typically doesn't seem to want to bother with wrangling with the estate of Edgar Rice Burroughs when it comes to making Tarzan content. Disney still owns their own adaptation of the character, but it seems like they just don't find it worthwhile to do a ton with it. 
It's also likely more difficult to extend those rights to Square and furthermore the manga, which is why we typically don't see it post Cage 1 the game. You can also see stuff like this at play with Nightmare Before Christmas, Tron, Pirates, and Winnie the Pooh, most plainly in Melody of Memory, where characters, or in some cases the full worlds from those franchises, don't appear. All this to say, I have no idea how or why the Cage 1 novel was the exception for the Tarzan stuff, since the first volume released in Japan in 2005, a few months before Cage 2 and a year after Chain of Memories, and also during the same month as the directed DVD Tarzan 2, it's not like there was some hardline date where Disney absolutely stopped bothering with Tarzan. But 2005 seems to be the last year where they did anything substantial with it. Except for the musical, which came out the year after, so who fucking knows. Bottom line, some things they found worthwhile to pursue, like the sequel movie or the musical, and somehow this novel, and some not so much, like the Cage games beyond Cage 1. There's no doubt they can do whatever they want with their own depiction of the character, but it seems like sometimes the papaya juice just ain't worth the squeeze. Deep jungle tangent aside, what about the worlds that were cut? Well, I guess the common trait they all share is the lack of Riku, Kairi, and Princess of Hearts stuff. Granted, Deep Jungle is pretty light on that, but it does have the Kairi hallucination and Sora outwardly expressing how he's looking for them throughout that world. But Olympus, Atlantica, Halloween Town, and The Wood are all more self-concerned, at least by KH1 standards, though it's a shame that we miss out on both of the party's transformations, as well as moments like the Doctor's Heart Experiment or Triton's speech about the Keybearer. Olympus especially is a world I always found to be pretty core to the KH experience, not just for how often it appears, but its themes of heroism and strength of heart, so it's definitely bizarre to see it cut from this adaptation of the first game. Even though it's optional in the game and doesn't really touch on any of the main plot elements, it always just felt important to Sora's growth. You may also be wondering, wait, if they cut those worlds, does that mean that the villain council is, and yeah, it's just Maleficent, Jafar, and Hook, which is like, really underwhelming and awkward. Losing Hades, Ursula, and Oogie definitely makes those castle chapel scenes a bit less imposing and fun. While the vast majority of the novel is text, there are the occasional Shiro Amano illustrations that pop up, and they're always pleasant. The cover art is especially fun, featuring SDG and Chip and Dale, although those two aren't really that present in the book. Jiminy is way more prominent here, and his presence here is more felt than in any of the games besides Calm or Coded. Also, I didn't even notice until writing my script that you can make out Agrabah at the top here, and very faintly Traverse Town and Disney Castle in the back. The very front of the novel includes a handful of color drawings, one of which was the cover for Volume 1 when the novel released in Japan. The English cover is the Japanese cover for Volume 2. I'll show some more of the other black and white ones when we go through the book in detail. My last major point before we get to the more nitty gritty comparison stuff is that the novel, at least in my eyes, felt like it was deviating and fleshing things out a bit more often during the first half and not so much the second. I don't think I was just finding it less interesting as I went on because of fatigue, it's a pretty short read, but because it seemed like it sort of dropped its earlier attempts to feel like something of a remix or give the characters just a smidge more depth. And don't get me wrong, the entirety of the novel includes word for word cutscene reenactments, so that doesn't really change throughout, but the second half just felt like it was doing the bare minimum at times. There's still fun moments and small changes, but fewer than in the first half, which you'll see soon if you choose to stick around. So that wraps up my general thoughts on the novel. Like I said, if you want to check it out for yourself, you can stop watching now. I mean, you could have stopped watching whenever, you obviously don't need my permission. Overall, it's pleasant. If you played the game, you're not going to have your mind blown by anything, but you'll come across some neat variations and new lines that might change how you look at certain moments from the game. But just don't go in expecting a manga level of zaniness or major changes. It's the game as a book, with very small but often charming additions. That being said, if you don't plan on reading the novel or already have, or just need something to listen to while you drive or do chores, we're now entering the second half. As I read, I took notes on each and everything that jumped out at me, as minor as they may be. This will be in something of a bullet point format for the sake of keeping the pace as brisk as possible. So, starting with the dive to the heart in the prologue, Sora's dream is truncated to basically just the on-screen white text parts, no dark side or any of that, which is probably for the best. It keeps the most important elements for setting up the door and the light versus dark thematic stuff, but strips out all of the tutorial junk, which obviously isn't needed for a novel, as fun as it would have been for the reader to be taught how to turn pages and use bookmarks. It also makes for a more effective and less redundant first appearance of Dark Side on Destiny Islands. Sora and Riku are actually both given tasks from Kairi on screen, or I guess on page. Riku is to gather the day one collectibles of the actual raft materials, while Sora is to get the day two items, the provisions. Waka is noted as the oldest. This is referenced in his journal entries in Chain of Memories and Coded, but never the first game. Not sure if this means just the oldest of the Final Fantasy trio or including Sora and Riku, but it's sort of weird to think of him as 16 or older, because he seems like 
I don't know, 14 at most. I don't really know how old children are supposed to be in media, so... Or even real life. They're all, like, in a range of 5 to 17 for me. Like, I think kids start teething when they're, like, 9. Waka also fights with a stick instead of his iconic blitz ball and is implied to have actually taught Sora how to fight. And do we have him to credit for Sora having any prowess with the Keyblade at all when he first started? Sora even recalls more combat advice from him when he's searching the districts in Traverse Town later on. Sora actually beats Riku in their spar. It's implied that Riku has literally always beat Sora and that this was a fluke. It's even noted that Sora gets worse grades than Riku in school. Sora and the narration definitely comes off painting him as much more envious of Riku than what we get to see in the game. Not necessarily a bad thing though, as it feels more fleshed out and gives Sora more of an arc. We're shown selfie Titus and Waka speculating that SRK is up to something, Titus actually wishing that he was a part of it. Unlike in the game, Sora is actually the one to suggest the name Highwind for the raft, which Riku and Kairi both like, so they just go with it. Both of Sora's parents are explicitly mentioned here. His mom, however, loses her only speaking lines. The conversation between SRK on the tree in the game actually happens on the newly completed raft in the book. They also tack the text bubble Thalassa shell scene into the middle of the Don't Ever Change scene, where the necklace falls out of Kairi's pocket. The first time we see them, Donald actually refers to Goofy with his full, proper title, Captain Goofy. In the game, before Donald and Goofy leave, Donald asks Daisy if she can take care of... something before she cuts him off, leading some to speculate what exactly he was going to say. The castle, Pluto, his internet search history, and the event that he died on the journey, etc. The novel just lets him finish his sentence, which he ends with, the Queen. Minnie is the one to tell Donald and Goofy that they must maintain the world order, and informs the duo that the gummy ship is being prepared for them. A nice change that gives her some degree of visible authority slash knowledge. The gummy ship is canonically a she. Most ships are, but now we know this one is for sure. Riku calls back to Sora when the former is being enveloped by the darkness during the apocalypse. Sora yells for him after he disappears instead of just looking up into the sky while holding the Keyblade. The novel kind of steps on the Kairi's heart is inside Sora's reveal, saying she passed through him and vanished. It was like she'd been sucked into Sora himself. Hmm, yeah, it really is almost as if that's what happened. The first person, or I guess entity, that Sora meets in Traverse Town besides Pluto waking him is a Moogle named Kupo. Sora then talks to what's described as an older woman who thankfully seems to be the lady near the cafe and not the prostitute from the manga. Her optional text bubble dialogue about not asking what world people came from is pulled for her dialogue in the novel. It's implied that Sora did not expect that someone who looks like Sid would be running a place called the Accessory Shop. Sid also asks if Sora is looking for a present for his girlfriend, which Sora pouts at. In retrospect, Sid comes off as fairly stupid, like too stupid considering the circumstances in both the novel and the game. He acts like he has close to no idea what Sora's talking about when he references being from another world or that his friends might be in Traverse Town, when Sid himself is from another world and ended up with his own friends in Traverse Town. But in the novel here, he notices Sora's Keyblade and says to himself, so that's the key thing, huh? Maybe I better tell Leon. So I don't know if he was just playing dumb or what. When Sora enters the second district, he actually tries to help Travis the blue shirt when he falls over instead of just, you know, watching him die like in the game. The scene of Aerith meeting Donald and Goofy in the alleyway behind the hotel is extended and they chat a bit more instead of it just cutting off after they first see each other. Sora accuses Leon of working with the shadow creatures when they first meet before their fight in the first district. The narration also amusingly points out that Leon is, in fact, a stronger opponent than Waka or Titus or Riku. Sora also loses the fight if you were curious since there are scenes for winning and losing in the game. Leon does confirm that Sid told him of Sora's and the Keyblade's whereabouts, which makes Sora's and Sid's conversations feel just a bit more disingenuous, like Sid was trying to trap him or something. Aerith describes the Heartless as ghosts that live in the darkness, and when presented with the information that darkness is in every heart, Donald protests and says that he and Goofy surely don't count, and Aerith is like, no, you count. You know that bad reading that Mandy Moore does of that line about Ansem's reports? The pages were scattered. Too many worlds. Its pages are scattered everywhere. Scattered. Too many worlds. But she totally says two double O many worlds, like the pages are in too many worlds, it'd be too difficult to find them all. Well, the novel just says across many worlds to avoid this, even in text form. In the green room scene, Leon and Yuffie give Sora an earlier explanation of keyholes, and Leon is able to ascertain that Sora likely saw a big door open when Destiny Islands fell to darkness. Also, it seems like a basic shadow pops up in the room instead of a soldier, like in the game. 
The guard armor fight happens in the second district instead of the third, probably because Donald and Goofy are launched into Sora directly from the hotel windows instead of the third district balcony, which they sort of inexplicably end up at in the game. They also manage to introduce themselves to each other by name in between fighting the mook enemies and guard armor. Speaking of which, the novel strangely names guard armor in the moment, but not Darkseid. It also never capitalizes Shadow, nor does it ever mention or describe the Soldier Heartless in the run-up to the guard armor sequence. The trio does come up with a video game friendly strategy of attacking one limb at a time instead of spreading their attacks across the limbs willy nilly. When they win, Sora gives Donald a hug even though they just met, and Goofy hugs him from the other side which is, as noted by several literary critics, cute as fucking fuck. They end up reintroducing themselves in a more true-to-the-cutscene way with the all-for-one thing, which is kind of funny since they literally just gave their names like two minutes ago. However, Jiminy actually introduces himself to Sora, which, if you recall, never actually happens in the game. He just sort of looks on from afar and is like, guess I'll be writing down a bunch of shit? He also states that he stays on the ship to watch over things, so I guess he isn't really in Sora's hood the whole time, at least in the novel. Goofy notes that they not only have plenty of items and accessories, but also snacks, which I like to imagine were purchased from the First District Cafe. We actually get a gummy ship interlude between Traverse Town and Wonderland. Sora is mad that Donald won't let him fly the ship, and Goofy says he's tried it before, but that it's pretty tough. They use the phrase Ocean Between a decent amount, which they never do in the game, and they do in fact see Wonderland in story as it appears in game, big heart checkerboard pattern and all. They park the gummy ship at the top of the rabbit hole and all of them float down, as does the ship. Sora asks the doorknob if he's seen a boy or a girl his age, and he said he did see a girl, leading Sora to believe that Kairi is in Wonderland. The novel notes that the Heartless and Wonderland look different than the ones from Traverse Town. It describes squat and round ones, which are probably large bodies, but also some looked like dragons floating in the air, which I have no idea what that refers to. Red Nocturnes first appear in Wonderland and float in the air, but they're pretty undragon like so I don't know if these are like wyverns or what. Much later on in the world, though, the party does remark on some Heartless who shoot fire. Goofy comments that the Queen's Court looks like the gardens back home, and Donald remarks that their gardens are much nicer, and refers to Disney Castle by name, which doesn't happen in dialogue until Dream Drop in the games. Sora has never heard of the word or concept of a trial back on Destiny Islands. SDG determine that they need to get evidence of the Heartless, and do in fact decide on finding things like claw marks or their smell, and eventually find some footprints. Goofy sniffs Sora's torn sleeve and remarks that the Heartless do smell, quote, weird. During these efforts, Sora falls on his ass, and Goofy gives him a potion. The talking flowers also appear, but instead of blooming in response to gifts, they bloom when the nearby Heartless are defeated, and they also help SDG get around by using their leaves. The Keyblade seems to pick the correct evidence box for Sora by leaning in a specific direction during the trial. Instead of a separate crank tower, Donald and Goofy worked on breaking Alice's cage while Sora fights off the card soldiers. In the Tea Party Garden, instead of sitting in each seat, SDG gorged themselves on a plate of cookies, which then causes Heartless to spun. Upon leaving an upside-down version of the Bazaar Room, Sora literally says, It's like a land of wonders. It's like a land of wonders! Riku! While exploring, Sora wonders to himself if he'll ever get to see Donald and Goofy again after they find the king. But then he invites them to go swimming at the beach on Destiny Islands, and Donald invites him to visit the castle to meet the queen and Daisy. While fighting the Trick Master, also referred to by name, Donald accidentally lights one of its clubs with fire, which the Trick Master then uses to light Donald's hat on fire in return, prompting Donald to turn on the faucet in the bazaar room to put it out. There is another gummy ship scene after Wonderland where the party laments that they've made no progress finding their friends and also that Alice has gone missing. Sora comments that the Heartless in Wonderland were way stronger than the ones in Traverse Town, so battle levels are canon. Just like in the game when they approach Deep Jungle, Sora and Donald fight over the controls and they end up crash landing. Deep Jungle is pretty much played straight word for word for the first two or three scenes. There's a small part where Tarzan and Sora fight Heartless together, which in the game don't appear until like halfway through the world. Clayton's dialogue is especially rigidly taken from the game, only adding like one new line before he shoots at Turk, before he shoots at the snake, mentioning how younger gorillas are worth more than adults. When SDG meet back up, Jiminy remarks that the gummy ship is just parked behind the tent. Sora and Donald argue far more than just the one scene in the tent, prompting Tarzan to ask, Sora? Donald? Friends? Not friends? They bicker throughout basically the entire chapter. The world, understandably, is shortened by stripping out all of the encounters with the gorillas save for the first one, and there's also no final Sabor showdown, just the initial one in the treehouse. Right after saving the first gorilla, the party returns to the tent to find Jane missing, then they go to the treehouse and find her and Turk hiding there, and then the fight with Clayton actually begins near the treehouse, all within about a page. 
Kerchak fucking punches the stealth sneak, which is what first causes it to be visible. Despite bitching at each other for the entire fight, the party manages to kill the stealth sneak who just turns to light and disappears instead of collapsing onto Clayton. Clayton just falls down and dies, making for a much less gruesome death. The keyhole is discovered, and Sora and Donald make up, and Turk lusts for Donald, so the ending portion is pretty much unchanged. After Deep Jungle, the first two villain scenes from the game, Assembly of Darkness after Traverse Town and Figures in the Darkness after Deep Jungle, are sort of combined. Hades' line about Sora taking down the guard armor, in this case referring to the stealth sneak, is given to Jafar, and instead of Oogie saying Hook is no prize himself, that line is also given to Jafar, since Atlantic and Halloween Town were cut from the novel. Likewise, Ursula's lines about turning Sora into a heartless and her musing about the princesses are given to Hook. After that, we have another scene of SDG on the gummy ship where they comment on how the gummy block they found in the Deep Jungle looks different than any they'd seen before, noting that there seems to be something in the center of it that glitters like a tiny star. On the second trip to Traverse Town, the party notes that the Heartless have again gotten stronger, also commenting on ones that spin around like a tornado, probably air soldiers, and ones that use powerful magic, likely the remaining prismatic melodies. The trio ends up exploring the hotel, and they all realize they were sitting one room away from each other talking to the Final Fantasy characters before they properly met. Since Trinity Marks aren't a thing in the novel, Goofy just has the idea of them all running into the grate at the same time to access the secret waterway. You could probably guess, but Leon doesn't give Sora a summon gem for Simba when they meet in the waterway. Also, since SDG was already given the lowdown on keyholes during their first visit, that's scrapped here and is instead replaced with everyone giving Sora a pep talk after he doubts his abilities to save the worlds. Just like in the game, the party needs to cast fire on the door in the 3rd district to reach Merlin's house, except Donald is the one to use it. Sora actually doesn't learn any magic throughout the entirety of the novel. Donald is also noted as being bad at the floating stone platforming segment and openly complains about it. So, since Sora doesn't learn any magic and summon gems aren't a thing, Merlin and the Fairy Godmother are kind of just useless weirdos. They show up when the party enters the mystical house after the Kairi hallucination and all, but they just have like a vague hint for Sora, apparently left by the king. They say, and I quote, There's not much time left, I can't go back, but the light is there above the darkness, and the darkness is beside the light. At which point Donald complains that none of this makes sense, which is correct. They continue, Darkness is lying in wait for you, but that there is darkness means there is also light. Merlin then says, Stay with the key and the path will become clear, and notes that this is the hint that the king left. So, wow, thanks, Mickey. Fairy Godmother does at least sense that Riku and Kairi are very close by. Riku because he's right outside, and Kairi because she's inside Sora, unbeknownst to him, of course. Also, the book delivery wasn't cut, but there's no mention of the book being the 100 Acre Wood. Goofy actually ponders what kind of book it is, and Merlin offers to let them read it, but Sora's like, no thanks, we'll read it next time, and leaves, and they never go back and read it, and we never see Merlin or the Fairy Godmother again, so it's like, really? Why was it even in there? I don't know. In their efforts to reach the bell in the second district, the party crosses through the gizmo shop, which is made to seem a lot bigger and more imposing than it is in the game, with the party risking getting crushed by giant gears if they don't proceed carefully. Instead of Riku appearing immediately after leaving Merlin's house, he shows up right after Guard Armor reappears in the second district and actually joins them for the fight against it. After it seemingly collapses, they then exchange the usual dialogue from the game. As Sora and Donald argue about Riku tagging along, the guard armor starts moving again and transforms into the opposite armor. It's also weirdly noted as having changed color, which it doesn't really do in the game unless it went from vanilla to final mix in front of their very eyes. Also, I hate to report on this, but Goofy heals Sora way more often than Donald does. He's done so like three times by the time they defeat opposite armor, and I think Donald did like once. And never with Cure. They never use Cure throughout the entire novel. It's always just potions or healing potions or potions for magic. Of course, by the time the opposite armor is defeated, Riku has disappeared, which frankly works way better than how it's portrayed in the game with him just sort of vanishing after they turn around for two seconds. Afterwards, instead of meeting up in the small house, Sora meets up with the whole FF crew in the accessory shop. They have their usual exchange about Maleficent and how she likely has most of Ansem's report. Sora comments that he'll find it, and Sid responds by saying, that's not very reassuring. The group all comments on how Sora has gotten stronger since he started out, and Leon and Yuffie both offer a rematch. As they all talk and laugh, Riku and Maleficent look on from outside the accessory shop and have their usual dialogue. It appears that Sid installing the navigation gummy also upgraded the entire operation and gave the ship a more spacious interior. Most in-game stuff refers to both Chip and Dale as gummy ship engineers, but the novel specifically names Chip as an engineer and Dale as a mechanic. This follows a conversation where SDG mused that Sid may be better with gummy stuff than the pair of chipmunks, which is maybe damning with faint praise considering that Sid is a fully grown human man. 
While flying to Agrabah, the party passes by Wonderland, prompting Sora to, fittingly, wonder what happened to Alice. It would have been nice to see more acknowledgement of what happened to both Alice and Jasmine outside of their respective worlds after they go missing in the game, so I'm glad the novel included that. Amusingly, when pulling up to Agrabah, Sora mistakes the desert as, quote, a beach that goes on forever until Jiminy corrects him. The first chunk of Agrabah is played pretty straight and by the book, or I guess, by the game. The first major difference is SDG talking to Aladdin and Genie about Jafar and the keyhole while flying back to the city on the carpet instead of the text bubble scene in Aladdin's house, but the dialogue is largely reminiscent of that scene from the game. Up until now, the novel has just described Sora's combat as basic swings, but upon returning to Agrabah after saving Aladdin, he uses what is effectively Strike Raid, prompting Goofy to comment that he's picking up new tricks with the Keyblade. Unsurprisingly, the novel doesn't bother to cover the platforming mini keyhole unlocking segment of Agrabah. It also cuts out the existence of the pot centipede. The scene before the boss still plays out as normal, with Jasmine falling into a clay pot that turns into a pot spider, but they never form the centipede, and the party just dispatches the spiders, with Jasmine having disappeared to the Cave of Wonders all the same. It's inconsequential, but everyone refers to the Cave of Wonders Guardian as the Tiger God, which is never done in either the game or the movie, so I don't know where this comes from. The boss fight, however, remains intact in the novel and is less annoying to read than to play. The novel understandably also yada yadas all of the stuff in the Cave of Wonders between entering and confronting Jafar. Everything is pretty much the same as far as his first boss battle goes, but the Genie Jafar fight involves Aladdin distracting him as Goofy throws Donald into the air as a stepping stone for Sora to jump on to reach Iago and the lamp. Back in Aladdin's house, Sora slash the narration seems to preemptively hint Kyrie as one of the seven princesses. Quote, one of the seven princesses, Jafar had said. He needed Jasmine for something, and so far, Sora knew of two other girls who had disappeared from their worlds, Alice from Wonderland, dot dot dot, and Kyrie. So maybe that meant, dot dot dot. Pretty heavy-handed, but you probably already know the twist if you're reading the novelization of KH1, but who knows. When Genie proposes going along with SDG as a favor to Aladdin, Goofy whispers to Donald asking if that constitutes as meddling. Genie replies that nothing's impossible for him, and then shrinks himself down and hides himself under Donald's hat. He then says that with him along, the party's magic will have a, quote, turbo boost, a limited time offer that they don't want to miss out on. Donald asks, is that okay? And Sora says, isn't it? And they never refer to it again. I don't know if we're supposed to, like, take it as Genie is literally, like, physically always under Donald's hat for the rest of the story, but they never even draw attention to it, even slightly, so. Also, I'm realizing at the end of this chapter that Abu never appears and is never mentioned at all, and in fairness, he never actually appears in any KH1 cutscenes, only gameplay portions, but it's kind of weird that they don't just say that he's running around with Aladdin at any point. In the following villain cutscene, which is now just Hook and Maleficent, the line about Jafar spoken by Hades in the game is now given to Hook. Aboard the gummy ship, SDG and Jiminy discuss the piece of paper left behind after they defeated Jafar. Jiminy reads it, and it's nearly the entirety of Ansem Reports 1 and 2, and about half of 3 combined into one page with very minor omissions throughout. Notably, only the first report is obtained by defeating Genie Jafar in the game, with report number 2 coming from talking to Aerith in the Hollow Bastion Library, and 3 from defeating Giant Ursula. Not long after reading the report, Monstro shows up and swallows the ship, and right on cue, Sora has a flashback to his childhood with Riku on Destiny Islands. Upon waking up in Monstro, the scene where the party discovers Pinocchio digging through a chest above them is combined with the optional scene of his appearance in Traverse Town on the second visit, with dialogue pulled directly from that scene, likely to streamline Pinocchio's whole situation for anyone who's somehow unfamiliar with it. After chasing Riku and Pinocchio, the first Parasite Cage encounter is skipped, and we're given the scene of Sora and Riku arguing in Monstro's mouth, except deeper within Monstro, with Geppetto having actually run in after the party. Kind of a shame that the team-up moment is cut out, since it was one of the few moments in the game of getting to see Sora and Riku work together on something, as tense as the situation may have been. Although we did at least get the guard armor moment earlier on to make up for it in the novel. This scene that originally took place in the mouth actually bleeds right into the scene that precedes the second Parasite Cage battle. Sort of weirdly, the line where Sora says his conscience is telling him that Riku is on the wrong side is changed to, it's telling me that letting you have Pinocchio is wrong. The Parasite Cage shows up like normal, although the novel notes that it shoots bubbles at the party, which it never does in either battle, but this might be referring to or being confused with its bad breath attack from the second fight. Sora actually jumps into the cage's mouth and presumably attacks it from the inside, it's kind of unclear, until the cage dies. Similar to the manga, it's implied that the gummy ship literally runs on happy faces and won't work if anyone on board is frowning, as shown when Sora is moping over his encounter with Riku and Monstro, and Goofy says, if you keep making that face, and Sora responds, I know, the gummy ship won't run. Whether this is a fatal flaw in engineering or a metaphorical but toxic motivational tool employed by Donald and Goofy, we may never know for sure. 
After SDG crash into Hook's ship, and yeah, it is weird to go right from Monstro to Neverland, we're shown the novel's version of the Riku and Maleficent scene in the captain's cabin, which usually plays right after Monstro and before you have control of the gummy ship again. After SDG fall into the brig, they cut out the how about getting off conversation, which is a crime against literature. I guess I should note, when Donald is tossing out spells now, he's saying Fyra, Blazara, and Thundara, so maybe that's supposed to be that turbocharged genie magic at work, although he was using regular Blizzard back in Monstro against the Parasite Cage, which was after Agrabah, so who knows. Also, during the Heartless encounters throughout the ship, Sora runs into one of the Shadow Soras, although these ones have their own Shadow Keyblades, which is inconsistent with the game, as only the boss Anti-Sora has its own Keyblade. Speaking of, before that battle, Sora has an additional line here, which raises a good point. He remarks that even if Riku doing all this bad shit helps Kairi get her heart back, she's going to be really bummed out and upset with him when realizing how he did that. But Riku doesn't really consider this, opting to summon Anti-Sora and leave without a response. Later on during the Hook fight, Donald casts fire on Hook, which causes him to run around the ship in a panic, which is a true-to-game detail that I thought was neat to see included. The ending of the fight is altered a bit, with Peter baiting Hook into charging after him, causing him to fall overboard. As he's falling, a scrap of paper floats out of his pocket, which is another Anson report that Donald grabs before it falls in the water. Last note on Neverland, unlike the game or with Genie in the novel, Tinkerbell doesn't join Sora, instead just floating alongside Peter and noted as looking sad as the party takes off from the clock tower. After Neverland, we see the usual scene of Riku talking to Maleficent in the castle chapel, and then switch over to SDG and Jiminy in the gummy ship, reading over the new page of the Anson Report. This one skips over report number 4 entirely, and is an amalgamation of reports 5, 6, and 7. In-game, these reports come from Maleficent, Aerith, and Oogie Boogie, whereas the actual report that comes from Hook is number 9, and talks about meeting King Mickey. After discussing the report and being unable to find Hollow Bastion, the party returns to Traverse Town to have Sid install the new navigation gummy. The book describes Sid as puffing on a cigarette as usual, which would actually be quite unusual, at least as far as KH goes, since he's always depicted with a toothpick in these games. The scene where Sora has his Kairi's grandma flashback also happens in the accessory shop instead, and for whatever reason, Aerith is like creepily hanging out in the back of the shop and doesn't come out until the trio leaves, and then chats with Sid about Hollow Bastion for a bit. I will say, given how much more often we get little moments of dialogue and levity between SDG and the book, it makes their abandoning him to follow Riku feel even more out of character and abrupt than usual. The moment is pretty much perfectly preserved from the game, but somehow feels even more weirdly cruel. As is tradition by this point in the novel, the platformy puzzly stuff is skipped over, and Sora and Beast bypass the waterway stuff and get right to the entrance hall to meet up with Riku. After Sora's line about all the friends he's made during the My Friends Are My Power scene, the narration literally lists all of his friends, and this includes the talking flowers from Wonderland. This does not include carpet, however, so true friends apparently can't be made out of fabric, or they have to be able to speak even if they have no face and are otherwise inanimate. Um, the rules of friendship are complicated, and the novel actually has a whole chapter dedicated to dissecting these nuances. No, it doesn't, but that'd be cool. Everything after that pretty much plays out as normal, with all of the usual scenes happening in the right spots, with much of the trek up the castle being yada yada. The party fights Maleficent, complete with floating rock thing and heartless minions, and she actually uses her Meteors of Heaven battle quote here, which I thought was a cool touch. Meteors of Heaven! Unleash thy fury! During the battle with the dragon, it says Goofy hands Donald potions to help him recover his magic power after casting spells. Zero out of ten. Unreadable book. This fight seems to be shorter than most, like it doesn't even get a full page dedicated to it, so, as a wise man once said, a fitting end for such a fool. After the dragon battle, they go back into the main castle chapel area, and in the game, this is when the wall to your left would sort of dematerialize and give way to the lift stop, but instead, Beast is able to sense Bell nearby and punches through the wall a nod to his field ability used in the waterway in the game. Another small but appreciated change, the party recognizes and acknowledges Alice and Jasmine in their glass containers when they pass by them in the Grand Hall. I seriously thought I skipped a page or something, but they actually just completely skip over the Riku Ansem fight. The whole speech beforehand happens, Riku knocks Donald and Goofy away, he brings the Keyblade down onto Sora, Sora blocks it, and Riku just disappears right after that, and then it goes right into Sora's sacrifice. A really bizarre choice considering they kept so many other boss fights in the novel, and they entirely omit arguably the most important one of all. After Sora turns into a shadow, the group doesn't even make it out of the Grand Hall before he's transformed back. Essentially, they run down the stairs a bit, but are confronted by a group of shadows there, and that's when Kairi brings Sora back. 
Interestingly, after the party escapes Hollow Bastion, the novel includes the final mix scene of Riku in the Realm of Darkness, which plays in-game after the scene with Kairi in the Secret Waterway. The novel didn't elect to show Riku arriving in Hollow Bastion earlier on, which is also a final mix exclusive, so I thought I'd point it out. After this, we actually get to see Kairi aboard the gummy ship with SDG, which we've never gotten to see in any of the games. She marvels at the ocean between a bit, and Sora talks about how he was so excited to show it to her and Riku. I thought this was a nice little addition, since the game sort of jarringly jumps back to the small house with Leon after leaving Hollow Bastion, plus it's cool to see Sora actually get to share a nice experience of seeing new worlds with one of his friends. This, however, is cut short when Heartless attacked the gummy ship, the only time in the novel that this is shown happening, prompting Donald to accelerate at full speed back to Traverse Town. It also seems to be implied that these are actual Heartless and not just their ships, unlike in the game. The return to Traverse Town has changed a good bit. The party arrives in the first district to be greeted by Aerith, who meets Kyrie. Donald excitedly tells her that they found Ansem's report and that Jiminy is keeping track of it, and Aerith is like, who is Jiminy? And they realize they never introduced them to each other. Then, instead of meeting up in the third district's small house, the party goes to the hotel of the second district to meet with Leon and Yuffie. The usual scene plays out here with some additional dialogue, including giving Kyrie a line instead of just having her stand there while other people talk about her. Leon comments that the other princesses are likely still in the castle holding the darkness back, and the party is relieved to know that Belle, Alice, and Jasmine are likely awake. Right after that, they read the new page of Ansem's report that Maleficent left behind. This one is just Ansem's Report 9, which as previously noted, details his encounter with Mickey and is usually obtained by defeating Hook. After talking to Sid about finding a new route to Hollow Bastion, Sid requests that Donald and Goofy stay behind to help him do maintenance on the ship, while Sora and Kairi go retrieve the navigation gummy from the waterway. This is a nice and logical change, since it's weird how Kairi just sort of appears in the waterway when SDG show up in the game. For whatever reason, they changed part of Sora's dialogue so that his comments about Kairi's voice bringing him back is only in his internal monologue instead of out loud. After leaving Traverse Town, the party is contacted by Chip on the radio, and they actually speak with Minnie, who reports that more and more stars are disappearing from the sky before the ship's communicator loses the signal. A nice way to remind everyone that there is an ongoing apocalypse at hand. After going through the warp hole and arriving back in Hollow Bastion, the party is fighting their way back up the castle when Goofy asks Sora, what if these Heartless are like you were, and they're all somebody from somewhere, people who just lost their hearts and got changed into Heartless? To which Sora responds, maybe, but we can't let anything stop us right now! Now, we know that destroying a Heartless doesn't actually mean killing a person, but Sora doesn't really have any reason to believe that by this point, so it's a pretty funny dismissal on his part. The party soon after meets up with the princesses in the Grand Hall instead of the Castle Chapel, and they all chat and introduce themselves. It's pretty much just their text bubble dialogue, but it did feel somehow more natural and like an actual conversation in the novel, for whatever that's worth. The party runs into the behemoth like usual, and they defeat it extremely quickly, with Sora hitting it with the Keyblade, Donald launching magic into its mouth, and Goofy standing back and supplying them with potions. They really lean into healer Goofy in the novel, for whatever reason. So this actually surprised me. When the party is leaving the Dark Depths to rejoin the princesses after sealing the keyhole, instead of arriving in the Grand Hall, they wind up in a misty, unfamiliar chamber. And then we get the unknown, aka Xemnas scene, which I had truly zero expectation of seeing in the novel. Which maybe I should have, considering there are novels for the other games, but it really took me by surprise for this to happen right after the Behemoth. It's amusing to me that the scene here in the book also recycles the Sora and Goofy dialogue from earlier, even though, you know, it's a book, so there's no need to scavenge for suitable voice clips in English. Also of note, Donald tries casting Furaga, Blazaga, and Thundaga on Xemnas, all of which bounce off of him, so his magic got upgraded to tier 3 at some point. The encounter doesn't last long before Xemnas fucks off, and the party winds up back in the Grand Hall, being greeted by Leon and the FF gang. After the usual cutscene that can't be skipped because it's unskippable, the princesses minus Kairi speak to Sora about Ansem using their text bubble dialogue from the Castle Chapel, and Aerith then hands over more of the Ansem report to Sora. In-game, she'll give you reports 2, 4, 6, and 10 in the library, whereas here she gives a combined report of the final mix only Ansem Report 11, followed by the usual report number 10. Report 11 comes from Kurt Zisa in-game, and in the novel is probably the most heavily edited out of the ones we've seen, although it's not really changing the meaning or tone too much here, just the verbiage. After she's finished reading the report, Aerith remarks, Ansem abandoned his own body for the sake of his research, to which Sora responds, and I quote, That's weird! When the party arrives at the Gate to the Dark and the End of the World, in the midst of their conversation, Sora's inner monologue recalls the lessons he learned from Peter, Aladdin, and Tarzan, which I thought was nice. As they make their way through the final dimension, they encounter another behemoth, which causes Goofy to remark, Didn't we already beat this guy in Hollow Bastion? I feel that, Goof. 
for some reason, Donald downgrades himself and uses Fyra on it, even though we just saw him use Faraga. Amusingly, the text reads, Magic shot from Donald's wand. They were definitely hurting it. If we were going by the games, they were, in fact, definitely not hurting it, as the Behemoth's horn resists fire entirely. It really is like the Kingdom Hearts version of Pikachu aim for the horn. At some point in the Heartless Onslaught, the novel describes one as like a large ball, which I'm assuming are dark balls. The books sort of stop bothering to describe any new Mook Heartless after Agrabah, so this is the first hint to a different species that we've had in quite a while. The trio falls to the bottom of the giant crevasse, and there was this line that I thought was funny. It seemed to be a rule that whenever the three of them fell from somewhere higher up, someone had to land on someone else. After that, the novel actually bothered to depict the world terminus, which I wasn't expecting since it seemed to skim over a lot of the less story-heavy gameplay stuff. Eventually, they make it to the machine in the Hollow Bastion lab room, and the novel notes, the voice that came from the machine chanted as if reciting a poem. It delivers the usual lore dump, albeit with some minor changes, but name drops the first Kingdom Hearts in the novel, just like in the game. After the machine is done, Sora says, What the heck is Kingdom Hearts?! After the gang ponders the machine's poem, which was nice to see since they're immediately ambushed by invisibles in the game, they go back into the hallway and find another piece of Ansem's report. Like the characters, I was surprised that there was any left, at least as far as the novel would be concerned. But this one is a combined version of reports 12 and 13, which are final mix-only drops from Sephiroth and Xemnas. Also, the novel says Goofy reads these ones out loud, which is hilarious to imagine. When he's done, he says, It's just more stuff that doesn't make any sense. The novel does, in fact, skip Chernabog and moves along to the Linked World section. The trio figures out that beating the Heartless will break off the Emblem door, so they get to it. Donald goes back to casting Faraga, I guess he can switch at will like in KH3. For the record, I've assumed the whole time that Genie is still under his hat, turbo-boosting his spells, not that we've ever been reminded of this. Also, remember how we were going to read that book that Merlin had? Damn, I sure hope Pinocchio and Geppetto made it out alright, not that we'll ever know. Eventually, the party makes it into Final Rest, where Sora hears the usual Last Safe Haven speech and remarks that it sounds like the voice from his dreams. The trio decides to take a break, and Donald says, Oh yeah, Aerith gave me some goodies, and he just has some cookies wrapped up in paper and a ribbon. The party reminisces about eating cookies back at the tea party in Wonderland and eating bananas in Deep Jungle. After their break, the trio heads through the door and ends up on Depressed Islands. We get the usual speech from Ansem, but when he's done, the ground splits from beneath them and they fall into the Endless Abyss, effectively skipping the first two Ansem fights. Which makes sense, I didn't really expect them to keep the boss rush in its entirety for the book. As Ansem gives his Darkness Conquers All Worlds speech, Darkseid surprisingly shows up somehow in the big black void and Sora manages to kill it. Nobody is ever noted as floating or flying here, so it seems like the Endless Abyss is... Um, well, it sort of has an end, or at least a floor. Just a line I wanted to point out, the novel notes, In the swirling dark, his keyblade shone brightly, cutting through the great black shadow. The shadow screamed. The idea of heartless screaming, or really making any vocal noises at all, is really unsettling. Interestingly, it seems like Darkseid sort of fuses with or transforms into the world of chaos, the novel noting, The shadow was consumed in the greater darkness, which then took some dire form, something like an enormous ship. The novel goes through a truncated version of the World of Chaos gauntlet, with Sora gradually rescuing both Donald and Goofy from the portals and skipping over the 1v1 and the room cores. We go right to the whole party versus Ansem, and they pretty quickly beat him using their usual formation. We get the usual Kingdom Hearts' late exchange, and Ansem dies. And that's about it. The novel describes everything after that pretty faithfully to the game, from closing the door, to a description of Kyrie back on Destiny Islands in the secret place, and even an epilogue chapter of the trio and Pluto in the grassy field. So, having gone over everything in excruciating detail, here are my final thoughts. It was actually better than I expected, though I didn't have the highest hopes or a huge amount of intrigue going into it. The writing is definitely simplistic and a bit childish, and some of you might be rolling your eyes and saying, well, yeah, it's Kingdom Hearts, but I don't know, I first played this game when I was six, and it always felt a bit more serious and had more gravitas than, like, any other media intended for my age demographic at that time. I'm not asking the novel to be constantly dark and edgy, but I guess I would have appreciated just a bit more bite to it and to maybe treat its reader a bit more seriously, even if those readers are supposed to be kids. I was reading a series of unfortunate events just a few years after I first played KH1, like, I remember getting the last book the same year I got KH2, and those books didn't feel like they were holding my hand or talking down to me. I'm not just talking about the themes being darker, I just mean like how things are written, the actual structure of sentences and use of vocabulary. Kids are smarter than most adults think. I even remember the KH1 strategy guide teaching me new words and phrases, and looking back at it now, it doesn't read as sing-songy or exclusively meant for kids. I'd be curious to know if the novels that cover the other games have pretty much the same writing style or if things shift when the games themselves get a bit more complex. 
I don't know, maybe I have too high standards for the novelization of a Disney game, but I think it could have done just a bit more to recapture that mystique that the game imparts. I still enjoyed it though, especially the first half when it felt like I was getting a bit more insight on Sora and Riku. I just wish the novel would have kept it up with stuff like that for the back half. So overall, I'd give it like a B- minus or so. It's cute, it's about my favorite game, and it wasn't a slog to get through, though I would only recommend this one specifically if you really, really like KH1 in the way that I do. And if you made it this far in the video, then I've already told you like everything even slightly interesting about it, so uh, sorry, but thanks for watching. Hey, long time no see. Um, I haven't done one of these at the end of a video in a while. Um, most people don't stick around for after the jingle in the first place, but I'm assuming that because this video is about a novel, that it's really going to be like the percentage of a percentage of folks who, who make it here, the real uh, the real diehards, so, which is perfect, because that's who I wanted to hear this. Well, first of all, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you for watching and making it to this point. Um, I also wanted to mention that this is my 100th video on the channel. Now, granted, there are, you know, some lower effort and uh, smaller videos in the mix there, but um, it's still kind of baffling to think that I have hit the upload button on the regular Pat channel 100 times. Maybe you could say it's less baffling when you realize that the three-year anniversary of the channel is also approaching um, on the 31st. Now, last year I did like a little video where I kind of talked about my story with YouTube and just my life leading up to that two-year anniversary. Um, I don't really have anything planned like that this year, mostly because in the grand scheme of things, my story hasn't really changed. If anything, I would just kind of be doing a victory lap. And in fact, if you'll indulge me, I said 2021 was the best year of my life, and 2022 is shaping up to kind of lap that. I attained Twitch partnership back in March, which I never thought would happen, to be honest. I never thought there'd ever be a check mark next to my name, unless it was someone being like, Yep, this guy's a fucking idiot. Check mark next to that. Uh, I was awarded the Content Creator of the Year Award at the KH20 Million Dreams Award, which um, is incredibly flattering as voted on by the members of the community. And most importantly, I met the woman of my dreams and I just love her so much and I'm just so grateful for her. It's been such a crazy and fulfilling ride so far. Um, weird stuff has happened to me along the way, but most of it's been incredibly positive and I'm just, I'm really still, I said last time, but I'll say it again, I'm the happiest I've ever been. I did not think I could be that guy. Um, but here I am. I think I'm pulling ahead. So just thank you to everybody who has stuck around this long, or if you're just joining, welcome. Um, all right, that's all for me. Again, thank you so much for an amazing three years and 100 videos, and I will see you next time.